Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Joseph Usinski. He is Professor of Political Science at the University of Miami. He studies public opinion and mass media with a focus on conspiracy theories and related misinformation. He is co-author of American Conspiracy Theories, editor of Conspiracy Theories and the People Who, Vil Who Believe Them, and he also has a textbook on conspiracy theories titled Conspiracy Theories, A Primer. And today we're going to talk about conspiracy theory. So Dr. Rusinski, welcome to the show. It's a big pleasure to have you. At. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. So uh, tell us first then, what are conspiracy theories? How do you decide to classify something as a conspiracy theory? Well, I'll start by saying everybody has a definition of their own, if they have a definition at all. And one thing you'll notice is that people tend to define, um, they tend to use their definitions quite selectively. So oftentimes what you see is that conspiracy theories are things that the other person believes. But the things I believe are conspiracy facts. They're true, right? So we tend to use the term as a pejorative to refer to other people's beliefs, but never our own, even if our own would qualify. So the definition I use is that a conspiracy theory is a uh, idea in which you have a small group of usually powerful people working in secret uh, for their own benefit and against the common good. And they're doing it in a way that undermines uh, bedrock ground rules against the widespread use of force and fraud. And further, we don't know if this idea is true or not. It could be true, could be false, mm -hmm. but, we, but we haven't determined that it's true. And in particular, our institutions and our experts who are trained in that particular area have yet to determine that it's true, either because they haven't investigated it or they have investigated it and just haven't found compelling evidence in its favor to warrant belief in it at that time. Now, on top of that too, and I'm sorry to, <laughs> to make this longer <laughs> and more complicated, um, but when experts investigate conspiracy theories, um, they have to do so openly and in an environment in which anyone can take that data, reanalyze it, challenge those findings, and do so without fear of reprisal. Right? So just to give a quick example, mm -hmm. if we take the Kennedy assassination from 1963, um, that assassination was investigated for evidence of a broader conspiracy. Uh, it was not found. So the official story from the Warren Commission and others who have investigated later is that Lee Harvey Oswald killed the president in 1963 and acted alone. Any other idea that suggests a group of people, a broader conspiracy to commit the murder or a conspiracy to cover something up remains conspiracy theory until it's investigated by the appropriate experts and shown to be true with open data and evidence. Mm -hmm. So, uh, trying to understand better how conspiracy theories work uh, politically and psychologically, are political extremists more prone to believing in them? It depends what you mean by political extremists. Okay. Right? There are some studies that suggest the connection between saying that you're an extreme liberal or an extreme conservative on a survey... Mm -hmm. and believing more conspiracy theories or having what we might call a stronger conspiracy mentality. With that said, I mean, if I was to ask a question to a lot of people and said, hey, rate how liberal or conservative you are on a scale of zero to seven, with zero being really conservative and seven being uh, really liberal, does putting a zero or a seven really make you an extremist? Do we have to worry about you? Are you going to blow things up? Are you going to go attack people? Are you trying to undermine democracy? 
is that what we really mean by the word extremism then? So mm -hmm. to me, I mean, there, there is some survey evidence that people on the extremes are slightly more um, conspiratorial. Of course, there's evidence showing the opposite too, but regardless, it doesn't, it doesn't, I don't think it matters that much at this point because I think we really need to think about what extremism means. Why do we care about extremism? What are those things that we're concerned about that we think are extreme? Because if I said, I want really, really low tax rates, that might be an extreme position compared to other people's preferences on tax rates. Does that make me an extremist? Does that necessarily make me more likely to believe conspiracy theories? No, it makes me someone who just doesn't want to pay taxes. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So... So I, I, I think this gets to a broader conversation of, um, particularly now when we use the word far right or extreme right or far left or extreme left, what do those things mean, right? Are we really talking necessarily about political positions and having political positions that are outside the norm, like policy prescriptions? Or is it about something else? It is, a, is it a willingness to put on a mask get a baseball bat and go march in the street and beat up people who disagree with you. Mm. That seems to be what makes the headlines. And that seems to be the sort of extremism that we're more concerned about, which is very different than someone saying, I'm really ingrained in the political system and I hold steadfast conservative or liberal views. It seems like those people are ingrained in the system and less likely to go out and um, take on the sort of acts that were concerned about and does the side of the political spect spectrum you're on matter when it comes to believing in conspiracy theories for example is it that being a conservative or a liberal makes you more likely to believing in them no um i mean there's some evidence that points that sometimes it's the republicans sometimes it's the democrats sometimes liberals sometimes conservatives but when you look in lots and lots of surveys over periods of time, you just don't find evidence that it's really one side or the other. And even when you find differences, they're not particularly large. Um, the big difference is in what they believe, mm -hmm. if they do believe particular conspiracy theories, right? So right. Republicans tend to believe ones that accuse Democrats and vice versa. Conservatives believe ones that accuse liberals and vice versa. So they're pointing fingers. They're making accusations of conspiracy. They're, they're just doing it each other, right? Um, you can say that there are probably situations in which you might get more conspiracy theorizing from one side than the other. But that has less to do with there being something inherent to conservatives that makes them more prone to conspiracy see theorizing than liberals right and again a lot of this comes down to what counts as a conspiracy theory and what doesn't right because imagine if you are a liberal um then a lot of the things that your side believes you're going to say well those are true or those are well evidenced or those are reasonable beliefs and those don't count it's just right. the beliefs the other side believes. Those are the crazy ones, and therefore they're obviously more prone to believing in crazy conspiracy theories, so they're more conspiratorial than we are. So there's no good evidence for us to claim that conspiracy theories are a partisan issue? Well, they're a partisan issue in the sense that, you know, when elites spread conspiracy theories, they can um affect the people who listen to those elites and they can drive mm -hmm. beliefs in the populace right mm -hmm. but that's that's not inherent to one particular side or the other right that's much more of a top down phenomenon it's the case that both sides want to point fingers at the other side and accuse them of conspiracy theory about equally um and again when you find differences they're usually not very big and if you look over long periods of time, they just they just sort of wash out. So, I mean, it could be the case that let's say there's major structural change in, uh, let's say in the U.S. in the party structure. Let's mm -hmm. say there's a realignment of who 
winds up belonging to which party, then it very well may come to pass that one side will be more uh, um, conspiratorial than the other. But that might have a lot less to do with conservatism making people inherently conspiratorial as opposed to liberalism. Mm -hmm. And by the way, since we were talking about partisanship, does it promote in any way anti-democratic impulses? Sure. I mean, if you think that there are powerful people out to get you in secret, you might be inclined to fight fire with fire, right? Mm -hmm. And take action against that supposed conspiracy. If politicians get elected based on the idea that they're going to stop a conspiracy that people believe is going on or, or go after the supposed conspirators, then they may use the uh, power of the state to attack those supposed conspirators you mm -hmm. know so imagine like i live in a state right now where there supposedly there's an agenda by school teachers to turn all the kids gay or trans mm -hmm. there's no good evidence that this is the case and no one said oh hey here's a kid who was turned gay by their teacher or something <laughs> like that no this is all sort of nonsense yeah the state's passing law after law to address this. So it, 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 we've seen numerous incidents like this over the course of human history. Salem witch trials in the mm -hmm. American colonies a few hundred mm -hmm. years ago. They th the authorities thought that women were conspiring with Satan. So they killed them. <laughs> the mm -hmm. Red Scare. Everyone was a communist. The communists were everywhere. They infiltrated everything. Well, let's destroy, let's grab a bunch of people, destroy their careers, and uh, snoop through people's mail and, you know, do all sorts of very undemocratic, un American things to them. So it, it happens quite a bit and it happens everywhere, right? So we, we have to always be on guard um, for this. And when it comes to American politics, specifically in your work, I read about uh, a distinction between partisan and ideological identities on the one hand and anti-establishment orientation. So uh, what is the difference there and why does that matter? So everyone's been talking about our broken politics, and mm -hmm. many of these folks blame polarization. Mm -hmm. The idea that people are becoming polarized, they've moved away from the center, and they have opinions that are way out on the edges. So there's mm -hmm. no middle ground anymore. Right. Now, I think that is true in some ways, in the sense that I think there are a lot of partisans who dislike each other and don't want to negotiate and it's certainly true at the elite level, where you can look at the voting records of senators and representatives over the last several decades and see that you don't really have so many conservative Democrats and liberal Republicans anymore. Instead, you sort of have, you know, a lot of party line ideological voting um, without a lot of overlap in the middle. And there, there was a lot of overlap in decades previous. Now, I don't, that's there and it's having an effect, but that's, to me, that's not the only thing that matters, mm -hmm. right? Because first of all, most Americans aren't, you know, hardcore liberals or conservatives. Um, they might have a party identity, but they don't know all the issues and they may disagree with their party on a whole lot of issues and may not even know it. Yeah. In fact, what a lot of scholars say is that Americans are very much ideologically innocent. There's maybe 20% of the country is like really conservative or really liberal. In a sense, everyone else is sort of, you know, they might be able to say I'm a liberal or a conservative, but their issue positions are sort of um, a mess or what political scientists might call they're, they're not very constrained. And they don't necessarily show evidence of having a clear-cut um, ideology. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's not just the it's it's not just that there's some polarization going on that's driving the things that we might be concerned about now in our politics. Um, 
so think about this. I mean, for the people who are really into politics, a lot of them see it as a battle between left and right. It's our side versus their side. Us, either the liberals or the conservatives, the Republicans or the Democrats, versus the other party, the other ideological camp. Yeah. And we're in a battle to get our way. But for a lot of people, that's not necessarily how they see things because they're not so ingrained into that. To them, it's much more, it's us, the people, mm -hmm. against the corrupt elites. And these elites, these leaders, the Congress people, all these folks in D.C., they don't listen to us. They don't care about us. They shouldn't be running things. They've betrayed us. They're compromisers. And um, perhaps they're even conspiring against us. Right? So it, it, it may not be a battle between left and right for a lot of people. It may be a battle between us, the good people, and them, the, the corrupt establishment. So taking putting those two things together, this idea of a left-right dimension, where you have people sort of moving potentially a little bit further to the edges mm -hmm. in some ways. Yeah. But another dimension that's sort of vertical, where you have people who sort of like the establishment, support it, and are ingrained in it. And then on the other end, people who hate the establishment. They think they're, you know, either either non-responsive at best, corrupt, or at worst, working against us, conspiring against us in secret. So in that sense, people may see it as a battle but it's like a populist battle. It's us, the people who have the true national will versus these elites who betrayed that national will. Right. So once you start accounting for that, what you start to find is that a lot of the things that we think of as either driving extremism or extreme are much more associated with hating the establishment as a whole rather than just being an ingrained partisan or ideologue and wanting to win partisan ideological policy battles. So the people who are strongly against the establishment are also in favor of political violence. They also show evidence of dark personality traits like narcissism and psychopathy. So my view is that if we're concerned about extremism, it's not someone who attends all the Republican meetings and knows all the issues and votes and donates and volunteers, that's not the person we're looking for. <laughs> it's somebody who has attitudes that are um, inclined towards, hey, I like political violence because if it blows up the system, that's good um, because the entire system is corrupt. Now, people can hold both sets of attitudes simultaneously, right? So if you think of a two-dimensional space with people being somewhere located along the left and right and somewhere from really liking the establishment to really hating it, people can wind up being anywhere on this. And often people have a combination of, oh, I'm a little bit on the right and I you know, support the establishment or I'm a little bit on the right and I want to blow up the establishment. So they could be anywhere in this two-dimensional space. Um, and people often show a combination of these things, right? So think of like, you know, political extremist groups are often a combination of some right wing attitudes or some left wing attitudes combined with antagonisms toward the political establishment as a whole. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I would like to ask you about beliefs surrounding the 2020 election fraud conspiracy theory. So over time, do we see that they are stable? Do they change? If they change, how have they changed? And do they have any relationship with partisanship? So what I like to say is that conspiracy theories are for losers. And this doesn't endear me to conspiracy theorists very much, <laughs> uh, but I don't mean it as a insult. I mean it rather as, um, uh, me, I mean it descriptively in that mm -hmm. who complains at the end of a football match or a baseball game? Never the winners, it's the losers, mm -hmm. right? Because for some people it's easier 
to say I lost, but I was cheated than it is to say I lost, but I was beat fair and square and I'll live to fight again another day. Yeah. For a lot of people, it's very tempting to say we were cheated. It was rigged. I should have won. I'm the rightful winner, but it was stolen from me. And in sports, you know, people blame the umpires or the referees or, or, or whatnot. They were paid off or they made the bad call or they were influenced by the crowd or something. And that's the same thing in politics. I mean, who's happy about the election and think it was run perfectly? Well, the people who won. <laughs> who thinks it was rigged? The people who lost. Right? Mm -hmm. So... What we find is when we poll before and after elections in the U.S. is that going into an election, everyone thinks that there's going to be fraud and it's going to be pulled off by the other side. But after the election, it's only the losers who think that fraud happened. <laughs> so <laughs> losers that say, yeah, they cheated. And usually between 30 and 45 percent of the losing side. In, in surveys think that, that it was rigged. So it's a very normal thing. It's fairly natural. And we've gotten by just fine on that. Now, what makes 2020 so different is that you had the losing president claim <laughs> while in office that it was rigged. And they were able to get numerous senators and representatives to repeat those claims as well. They were able to get massive media coverage for these claims, and they were able to get much of the conservative um, media to parrot these claims also. So you essentially had tons and tons of information going at people on the right after the election saying, rigged, 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 rigged. It was all rigged, yeah. um, and it was stolen from us. Now, because of that, you wind up in polls with between 60 and 80% of Republicans saying that 2020 was rigged, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a lot more than you would expect just naturally. Yeah. And I would say too, on top of that, is that Trump has sort of reshaped the Republican party in the last, last few years. I mean, when he came into electoral politics mm -hmm. he didn't have any governing experience he wasn't really a republican <laughs> in any normal sense of the word and he didn't have a ready-made coalition there to support him in fact it was tough for him to get any endorsements and wasn't clear who his supporters were going to be yeah and he was up against 20 other more experienced more republican republicans for the nomination <laughs> so what Trump had to do was to change the game. And instead of saying, hey, I'm someone who can deliver well in office, well, he can't show that because he's never been in office. And hey, I'm someone who's going to do lots of Republican stuff. His issue positions prior to then were all over the place. He changed the game. He said, hey, Jeb Bush, hey, I know that you're the person picked to get the nomination. And that's great that you served uh, as Florida governor and were fairly successful. But that just means you're that much more corrupt than me. So the fact that you have political experience means that you're going to be just another another monster of the swamp. Yeah. So that sort of changed everything. And what Trump was doing was appealing to something very different than the other Republicans were appealing to. And that was um, populist views and conspiratorial views, amongst many other things. So Trump was attracting different people. And because of that, Trump, Trump's core supporters, not just Republicans who support Trump because Trump's, you know, the leader of the party, but I mean, people who are, who are bought Trump's message, the MAGA people, the people mm -hmm. who are for Trump, but less so for the Republican party. I mean, those people are very different than the people who would support um, Jeb Bush or Marco Rubio or, or any of those other candidates. So Trump's coalition on its own was attracted to him because he was giving out conspiratorial and populist 
anti-establishment cues. Everything's corrupt. DC is a swamp. It needs to be drained, right? Everything's rigged. So he's attracting people who already buy this stuff, right? So it was only natural that when he lost, that all of his supporters are going to think it was rigged against him because they're already prone to thinking that everything's rigged against them. So, so it, it, so in a way, it doesn't, it shouldn't surprise anyone that you have a lot of um, Trump supporters thinking that 2020 was rigged against them. I mean, it's almost what we would call overdetermined. And there's lots of factors driving um, people to think that. Uh, and uh, do we know if uh, merely exposing people to conspiracy theories has any sort of causal power over belief? I mean, just by being exposed to them, is it that people can just start believing them or not? I mean, it could be the case, but I would I would rather say something like this, that it's, um, it's probably not unicausal. Hmm. And... I mean, here's an interesting thing. I get a lot of calls from journalists about what's on social media today. It's like, Joe, oh my God, um, I saw a new conspiracy theory on Twitter. And I say, well, so what? And they say, well, everyone's going to see it. It's going to spread everywhere. And then everyone's going to believe it. And I said, okay, so did you see it? And they say, yeah. And I say, so you must believe it then. And they say, no. <laughs> and I say, well, what makes you so special? What's your magic power um, that the rest of us rubes don't have? You know, what's your, what, you know, um, what makes you so smart and the rest of us so gullible that everyone's going to be tricked into believing this thing, but you, you're smarter than everyone else and you won't be affected. And then they start to realize not everyone believes everything they see. And, and, and I think that that idea really gets lost. There's this popular perception that every advertisement makes everyone just go out and buy stuff. Yeah. And that's just not true. We see advertisements all the time. We don't buy a lot of the things we say, <laughs> right? People say right. Facebook ads are targeted at you and they make you go out and buy stuff. I don't buy anything from those ads in, in more than a decade. And many people don't. I mean, if these, if these ads, if, if social media messages were so powerful, they would have an infinite value. And Zuckerberg would be able to charge millions just to put an ad on his site, but he doesn't because they don't, <laughs> right? So we have to understand that that messages, whether they're advertisements or social media posts or whatever, yes, they could be influential, but in very specific ways. And, and they often lack the sort of uh, persuasive power that we ascribe to them. And, and on top of that, on top of that, um, people tend to think that they themselves are immune to influence from conspiracy theories and fake news and misinformation, but that everyone else is being influenced by it. <laughs> so everyone's, yeah. everyone's gullible. I'm not right. And everyone thinks that. Mm -hmm. So there's always this concern that, Oh my God, it's so influential, but not me. Right. The answer mm -hmm. is that it's not really that influential. Right. If I expose you to a conspiracy theory um, that accuses your group, your party of doing something, you're going to reject it flat out, most likely. If I expose you to a conspiracy theory about things that you just don't believe in, you're going to reject it flat out. So simply going up to someone and saying, hey, there's a conspiracy theory to hide the fact that the earth is really flat. I can go around telling people that all day and most people aren't going to believe me at all because <laughs> yeah. they're just not going to buy into that. I go around telling everyone, oh my God, there's uh, lizard people who control the planet. They're going to be like, I just don't believe it. I don't believe your conspiracy theory. So to say that these ideas are so persuasive, I think it's just it, it, it just expresses a massive overestimation of how of how uh, um easily persuaded people are people just aren't that easily persuaded we can be convinced of things that match what we already believe about the world mm -hmm. right yeah. so but once you think about that for a minute yeah i can convince you of things that you already want to be true 
but I'll have a much harder time convincing you of things that you don't already agree with or don't want to be true. But then uh, do we have a good understanding of how and why conspiracy theories develop and spread? So <sighs> develop uh, is sort of a tough question. I mean, again, okay. conspiracy theories are just ideas, right? Mm -hmm. And like any other idea, somebody can come up with it, or lots of people can come up with it at the same time, and they can share it in a whole bunch of different ways. They can mm -hmm. talk to their friends about it. They can put it on social media. They can call people. They can put it on WhatsApp. They can um, send out flyers about it. Or they can just keep it to themselves. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is that we tend to only see the conspiracy theories that do sort of take off, right? Mm -hmm. Like, how do I know that there's a conspiracy theory out there? Usually because the media tells me or because I see people talking about it on social media. Right. But what that means is there's a whole lot of conspiracy theories out there that we're not seeing. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. I mean, we tend to think that these ideas get so big and then spread everywhere. But as far as I can tell, a lot of conspiracy theories, perhaps most, they'll pop up. They'll be talked about for a few by a few people, maybe for a short period of time, and then they're gone. They die on the vine. They don't take off. They don't convince millions of people. They don't get studied by people like me. They don't get polled on. They don't get books written about them. People don't make movies about them. So, so yeah, take something like JFK. That's one with movies and books and it's been popular for 60 years and majorities of Americans believe in some form of Kennedy conspiracy theory, but that's not your average conspiracy theory. Most conspiracy theories are here and gone, forgotten, mm -hmm. very soon after they were developed. So, so to say, oh my God, these ideas all pop up and then they go out and they spread everywhere. Well, most don't, most die. <laughs> most die very fast. So if we think that they all get so popular just for the fact that they're conspiracy theories, then then we really have um, a wrong-headed view of the phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Now, you also mentioned the word spread. So right. I think oftentimes we're, we're sort of thinking of, of misinformation, conspiracy theories, fake news in terms of spread. I think there are reasons why that word has captured us. Um, we tend to think, oh, it's people, I get an idea and I share it, and then they share it, and we're all sharing it, and it sort of spreads. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, you know, we'll, some people will think of conspiracy theories as spreading like a disease, right? So during the, during the pandemic, it's, it's an infodemic, as bad as the pandemic itself, where people are getting infected with a conspiracy theory, then they spread it everywhere, and everyone else spreads it. Mm -hmm not really how it works i mean people a lot of people have immunity to these ideas right so again if you tell me an idea that i'm not already inclined to i'm going to reject it i already have natural immunity right so it's just not the case that everything's just spreading and spreading and spreading it just doesn't mm -hmm. work that way and more often than not a lot of these ideas are sort of top down they come from media elites or political elites and they're shared with followers so in that sense it's not spread in the way that we often categorize it like just regular folks like you and i sharing ideas that just keep mm -hmm. going around in this sense you know the big spreaders if we're going to call them that um i might prefer the term like influencers or just elites um are people like trump so mm -hmm. when trump comes out and says yeah the pandemic is a hoax are we really talking about spread amongst people? Or are we talking about Donald Trump giving top-down cues to his followers, telling them this, right? right? So it's not so much about this spread going this way. It's much about sort of top-down issues. And that's where we need to focus a lot more. I mean, one thing that's happening right now is that, I mean, Trump was indicted. So a lot of people are saying that the district attorney who's charging Trump is backed by George Soros, the billionaire philanthropist. Yeah. So you see this language coming from numerous Republican, 
politicians and numerous uh, conservative news outlets. Now, is that spread? I mean, if everyone winds up thinking that the DA is controlled by Soros, is that really spread? Only in the sense that it's coming from these top-down places and getting spread to the masses, but I don't think that's what we often think about when we use the word spread. I mean, this is a lot more about politicians saying it and certain media outlets saying it, right? So oftentimes when we're talking about what can we do to stop the spread of conspiracy theories, and you have government officials saying, we need to stop the spread of these things. Well, go talk to your fellow politicians and tell them to cut it out <laughs> because they're <laughs> the ones sort of propagating these ideas. Does it make sense to talk about conspiracy theories as forming a belief system? Um, sometimes. Hmm. Um, I, I mean... It, it, it does seem to be the case that some people are clearly more conspiratorial than others. Some mm -hmm. people buy into sets of conspiracy theories that sort of match and make an ideology in the sense that all these ideas go together and they sort of point out who the good guys are, who the bad guys are, what the bad guys are up to. Um, so in that sense, yeah, I mean, there is something of a belief system there. It's not the only belief system that people would have. Um, but it does seem to be the case that these ideas aren't just randomly picked up by people. They tend to be undergirded by our other beliefs, by our personality traits, by our other worldviews. So when you look at what specific conspiracy theories people believe or don't believe, what you find is that oftentimes these things sort of make sense, right? The beliefs kind of go together in a certain way. Not perfectly, but but there is evidence suggestive that, you know, people pick and choose what they want to believe, and often those beliefs are somewhat coherent. Uh, do we have any idea if over time, and I'm asking you this because over the past few years, some people have come up with terms like the post-truth era and stuff like that. So do we have any idea if conspiracy theories have increased over time in number and also in terms of the number of people who believe them? So in terms of the number of conspiracy theories, there's no way to know that, mm. right? Because conspiracy theories are just ideas. So change the question to, have the number of ideas increased over time? <laughs> How do we know? How can we measure that, right? Yeah. So... Um, that's never really been kept track of. There's no way to know if it's increased. And even if there was a way to track it, it'd be kind of difficult because there is no official version of any conspiracy theory, right? Hmm. Like anyone can make up anything they want anytime for any reason they have. So um, oftentimes people are might be conspiracy theorizing about the same thing, but have somewhat different versions of it. Do we count those as the same theory or are they different theories, right? I mean, half the country believes JFK was killed by a conspiracy, but when you ask what's the conspiracy, everybody has a different version. Is that one theory or is that hundreds? Um, the question that, that I can't answer mm. uh, to some extent is, are these ideas believed more now than they were in the past. Our, our beliefs in individual conspiracy theories increasing over time. The answer is that there doesn't seem to be a, a consistent trend in increases over time. Whether we're looking at short term, you know, over the course of months or a few years or even long term, it just doesn't seem to be the case that um, there's just some trend going up, 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 up. And there doesn't seem to be a trend during the social media era either, right? So when people say, you know, people believe conspiracy theories more now because of social media, well, first of all, there isn't good evidence that they believe these ideas more now. Second, it doesn't seem to be the case they believe them more now because of social media, because <laughs> they don't believe them more now. Um, so to me, this is a lot more... I mean, these beliefs are a lot more just ingrained 
in human society. It's a very natural thing. I'm not going to say it's a good thing and there's nothing we can do about it, but there's nothing new about it. And simply having new communication technologies like the internet doesn't mean that everyone's going to believe believe them more, right? I mean, take as a critical case COVID. Mm -hmm. The pandemic hits, everyone has to get locked down, and everyone's on the internet <laughs> all day long. Yeah. You should expect belief in all sorts of COVID conspiracy theories to be shooting through the roof. And you should expect all of these beliefs to be the most believed conspiracy theories out there. Oh, we didn't find evidence of either of those things. Right? The beliefs were largely stable over time when we polled and repolled and repolled and repolled over time. Right? So they should have gone up, never did. I mean, QAnon beliefs, the idea that President Trump is fighting a group of satanic pedophiles who control the world. <laughs> Um, and that he's working with a secret agent named Q to bring down this cabal. I mean, that was reported by the media for years. It's, oh, it's taking over the world. It's big and getting bigger and big, 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 big. It's spreading everywhere. There isn't good evidence of that. We polled and we polled and we polled and we polled. And, you know, for the most part, um, we didn't find any clear trends of increases in a lot of ways. It actually, as more people learned what it was, we had more people disliking it rather than liking it. So I think there's, there's always alarm in the media. We're in a post-truth world. It's the golden age of conspiracy theories. There's always a crazy headline to tell us, you know, doom is around the corner because that sells news copy that gets the clicks but there isn't good evidence that any of it's true. So, but since you mentioned the pandemic, let me ask you another question. Is there any evidence that there's been a relationship between conspiracy theory beliefs and, for example, vaccine hesitancy? Yeah, there's relationships, mm -hmm. right? What we tend to find is that people who believe more conspiracy theories are less likely to get vaccinated. The question is why, mm -hmm. right? So this becomes a really important question because the popular assumption is, well, we'll just get rid of the conspiracy theories and everyone's going to march off and get vaccinated. Yeah. That's a fantasy world, <laughs> right? I mean, there could be a lot of things going on. People who aren't going to get vaccinated are often choose not to get vaccinated for a whole lot of reasons. It's not just, oh, I saw a conspiracy theory and now I'm not going to get vaccinated. A lot of it um, could be, well, I'm not going to get vaccinated and now I'm going to go out and seek reasons to justify my decision. So, of course, I'm not going to get vaccinated. I just found out that the vaccines have baby parts or have satanic stuff in them or will change my DNA or will magnetize me, right? A lot of people were against vaccines long before COVID showed up and long before COVID conspiracy theories showed up. So there's nothing new there. And what we find is that people who aren't going to get vaccinated, sometimes they believe true things, right? And it's those true things that lead them, or at least they say, to not want to get vaccinated. So what we find, are you going to get vaccinated? Someone will say no. And they say, well, how come? And they'll say, well... A lot of people get vaccinated, they still get COVID. So I'm not going to get it. Well, that's true. Yeah. People get vaccinated, sometimes they still get COVID. Obviously, the symptoms are more mild and they're safer having the vaccine than not having it, but mm -hmm. it's absolutely true that you can still catch it even though you're vaccinated. So now it's not um, a conspiracy theory or some piece of misinformation that the person says is driving their belief, but actually something true, but they're just interpreting it in a way that, you know, we, we believe is incorrect and that's leading them to the incorrect decision. Right. Yeah. So, so we, we, you know, the thing is we just can't go around blaming wrong information for everything people, for, for people do. Sometimes people make up their minds, not just because they were exposed to some idea, but it's an outcome of a whole lot of things being put together.
So with all of that in mind, let me ask you one final question or one final topic about one final topic. So um, earlier you mentioned when I asked you about the, I mentioned the spread of conspiracy theories, but uh, you mentioned that perhaps one thing that people could do would be to say that uh, people who are part of the elites should just stop talking about or stop uh, putting conspiracy theories out there uh, and they're exposing people to them but uh, but do, uh, i mean uh, how serious how seriously do you think we should take um conspiracy theories and misinformation in general and if we should take it seriously what are some other uh, scientifically validated strategies that we could resort to to avoid exposing people to that so first i want to say i don't want to live in a world without conspiracy theories okay i mean conspiracy theories could turn out to be true and in a democratic society people have to be free mm -hmm. um to criticize the government to theorize about what's really going on and to investigate that. Yeah. And attempts to ban those ideas, censor those ideas, um, I, I think are incredibly anti-democratic okay. and should be, I mean, I, I would fight against any such plan um, because it's it's very, it's incredibly dangerous, right? Mm -hmm. um, particularly when the idea is that conspiracy theories often accuse the powerful of doing bad things. So of course government wants to ban them because they're the ones getting accused all the time, right? They would love to live in a world without conspiracy theories. <laughs> of course, they'd love to live in a world without conspiracy theories that accuse them of conspiring, but they're happy to spread them about other people that they don't like. Right. But that's the that gets to the key problem. We're going to give politicians the power to decide what's true and what's not, and then to enforce it with censorship. No, that's terrible, because the ideas that will be censored are the ones that are critical of them. And we can't allow that. Mm -hmm. We have to be free to formulate ideas and test them in a democratic society, particularly when they come to the behaviors of the powerful. Um, second, we can't always know what's true and what's not. I mean, there's this yeah. sort of naive out idea out there like, well, we know what's true and we know what's false and we'll just ban the false stuff. No, we don't know that. I mean, look at the fact checkers that we have out there like PolitiFact and whatnot. I mean, they screw up all the time because <laughs> it's not an easy job to always determine what's true and what's false. I mean, we've struggled with this yeah. uh, our entire existence, right? It's always been an uphill battle trying to find truth. It's not easy. It's not readily apparent. It's not like you get up in the morning, open your eyes, and you just see truth everywhere. <laughs> um, it's hard to discern. And that's why we have experts and journals and this and that. But even with those things, even with you know the best science available to us right now, we get things wrong all the time. Often by accident, sometimes on purpose. Um, but the thing is, we're wrong often, and there's often no way to know what the truth is. So having government step in and say, well, we're going to ban the things that's not true because we know what is true. Well, that just doesn't work. It's naive. Um, I mean, this is the idea that conspiracy theories and misinformation have powerful effects on people. Yeah, they have some effect in some instances more so than others. I would prefer that we have more truth, more truthy ideas rather than more misinformation and, and unevidenced conspiracy theories out there, but um, you know, that's not an easy task because again, we don't always know what's true and what's false. And we have to be able to formulate and test ideas. I mean, part of finding truth is entertaining ideas that we're not sure if they're true or not, and that may turn out to be false later. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you were to, uh, are there ways to get people to change their minds? Yeah, sometimes, not always easy. I mean, if someone has their heels dug in about an idea, good luck changing their mind. 
right? There's not much you can do. But in cases where somebody might have been exposed to a conspiracy theory, they're not that sure about it, they don't know, um, you probably can change their mind with authoritative information. Um, if you get to people in advance, um, there's evidence that you can pre-bunk them, tell them, you know, you're going to be exposed to a lot of false information out there. Um, just be careful. Here's what the truth of the matter is. If anyone says something else, you know, it's, you know, you should be skeptical. Um, that works to some extent. But I mean, if, if I were, um, if I were a politician, I mean, I would probably be more concerned about what my po fellow politicians were doing rather than be concerned about what the public is doing, right? I think if parties want to have a commitment to truth, if they want to fight misinformation and conspiracy theories, then they need to hold their own members accountable, right? So if you're going to go out lying all the time, then we're not going to let you run under our banner. You can still run as independent, but, you know, mm -hmm. at some point, um, you, we, we don't want you around. You know, they're not going to do it. <laughs> I mean, it comes <laughs> it, 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 because they like lying, right? Yeah. <laughs> it serves their purposes in some instances, right? Yeah. Um, so to me, um, politicians need to hold themselves accountable. Party apparatuses need to hold themselves accountable, right? If someone's going to come out and lie and lie and lie and lie and spread and, and engage in dangerous conspiracy theories and accuse this group and that group of all sorts of things that are nonsense, then the parties should be able to stand up and say, "No, you're out." But they won't do it because they don't want to. They don't want to take on the costs. They'd rather have liars represent them than than deal with it, and that's unfortunate. So, I mean, we can go down that rabbit hole and say, well, why not? And then we get to a place where they don't really care about lies that much. Because <laughs> if they did, they would do something about it. Um, because the biggest liars are in their own midst. <laughs> midst. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, uh, Dr. Usinski, just before we go, would you like to tell people where they can find you and your work on the internet? So I'm on Twitter at, at Joe Yuzinski, and on the internet, my website is joeyuzinski.com. Um, and my textbook just came out in second edition called Conspiracy Theories of Primer um, with uh, my co-author Adam Enders. And uh, that's available for purchase right now on Amazon if you want to sort of get the lay of the land in a very easy, accessible way. Um, I recommend it. Okay, great. So I'm leaving links to that in the description box of this interview. And thank you so much again for taking the time to come on the show. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Have a good one. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching the interview until the end. Please do not forget to share the video, subscribe to the channel, and also leave a like. And if you like what I'm doing, please consider supporting the show on Patreon or PayPal. You can find the links in the description box of the interview. This show is brought to you by Enlights Learning and Development Done Differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters. Perga Larson, Jerry Mueller, Hans Frederick Sunda, Bernard Seixas, Olaf Alec, Jonathan Visser, Adam Castle, Matthew Whitting, Bird Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Robert Windegger, Rui Nassio, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Simon Columbus, Phil Kavanagh, Michael Stormir, Samuel Andrea, Francis Ford, Tiago Nunes, Alexander Dan Bauer, Fergal Cusson, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Jonathan Leibrandt, João Linhares, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, João Weira, Tom Hamel, Sardas France, David Sloan Wilson, Yassila Dez Araújo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Yannick Punter, Adana Rosmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostazebski, Nelek Bach, Guy Madison, Gary G. Elman, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paul Tolentino, João Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wisman, Morten Eichland, Dr. Bird, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Mau Maria, Paul George Arnaud, 
Luke Loaki, Georgios Theophanes, Chris Williamson, Peter Wolosin, David Williams, Ruth Towell, Diogo Costa, Anton Erickson, Charles Murray, Alex Shaw, Amory Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Pedro Bonilla, Ziegler, Bangalore Atheists, Larry D. Lee Jr., Old Herringbone, Sterry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Gracies, Tom Roth, the RPMD, Igor N., Jeff McMahon, Jake Zul, Barnabas Radix, Mark Campbell, Richard Bowen, Thomas Dobner, Luke Neeson, Chris Story and Manuel Oliveira. A special thanks to my producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Tom Van Agdam, Bernard Hugni, Curtis Dixon, Benedict Mueller, Vega Giddy, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, John Carlo Montenegro, Robert Lewis and Al Nick Ortiz, and to my executive producers, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codrian and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.